announcement. Um, bef ju just before we start uh, the, the, this session, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, you are all uh, invited to the same place for lunch. Uh, I'll go with you and uh, hopefully some of the, our fellows will join you for you know, communication and discussion. And they are coming, yeah, which is great. Uh, <coughs> one thing, because we are, uh, you know, I know it's not uh, uh, you are here, but some people and, you know, I fixed the weather, so now there are less and less people that are in the room. So what I suggest that um, in the afternoon, uh, we'll uh, move the keynote. I mean, we have uh, uh, one talk on emotion and uh, uh, that we'll have uh, only one talk. The other will be a poster. So we will be back from lunch a little bit early. So we'll have an half an hour to, to see the posters and talk to the people that present. And then uh, uh, we'll have a, a, the talk. Uh, it will be the last one. And then we'll move the keynote, Eva Iluz, immediately after. So you will have a free afternoon. And we'll meet with convey. Some pe somebody is uh, smiling. Yes. And uh, uh, we'll convey back to, the, to dinner. However, if you are not expected to come back to dinner, which is a great dinner, by the way, and a great place. Uh, if you are not expected, please let us know, because we invited, and the, there is a lot of money involved. So please uh, uh, just mention that you cancel it. So we have your confirmation for dinner. But uh, uh, once you have a free time in the afternoon, uh, you can go to the market, to the, uh, I can give you some suggestion, but let's do it after we start the, the session. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay, here we are. Um, <coughs> so, um, let's start again. It's a great honor to open this pa panel, and I feel honored to be here today. The panel has been named as a whole individuals and social political orders, and indeed this question is at the very center of my research project. In the next minutes, I will give you a general overview of this project, which I am currently pursuing at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities in Edinburgh. The project aims to write a history of intelligence as a means of forming socio-political distinctions. It discusses Germany and Great Britain between 1880 and 1990, and it analyzes mostly popular debates about intelligence, smartness, and dullness from a comparative perspective. But before detailing the project analytical focus and its central questions, let me begin with a few introductory remarks about the one word on which this project is focused. So as a first step, let us direct our attention to the concept and notion of intelligence. The 
modern concept of intelligence did not evolve before the early 20th century. Certainly, discourses about the human wit and the capacity of thought are much older than this, and the word intelligence evolved out of the term intelligentsia, which already existed in antiquity. But historians of psychology stress that only since the early 20th century, intelligence became to be considered a coherent and quantifiable quality of human minds. This quality could be evaluated with the then developing tools of mental testing and psychological intelligence diagnostics. Although intelligence seems to be almost ubiquitous seen from today, this had not always been the case. For instance, the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1911 did not yet include a separate entry on human intelligence. In contrast to the interpretation of the intellect, intelligence here was described as the readiness to grasp, grasp a situation in the practical sphere. In the entry on animal intelligence, the encyclopedia quoted a definition by George Romanus which considered reason or intelligence to be the faculty which is concerned in the intentional adaptation of means to ends. After the First World War, the concept of intelligence as a coherent and quantifiable quality of human minds was increasingly popularized. Encyclopedias now began to include more technically psychological entries, such as intelligence test, intelligence quotient, which is the ratio of mental age to chronological age, or intelligence scale, defined as any series of intelligence tests by means of which an individual's stage of mental development can be estimated or measured. But despite all efforts to define and to measure intelligence, the concept remained contested throughout the 20th century, both scientifically and politically. Although intelligence has been described as the most researched concept in psychology, there has never been a unanimously accepted position on what, in fact, constitutes intelligence, how it develops and where it comes from. But interestingly, these debates do not seem to have compromised the popularity of the concept in the public and its concrete use in social situations. Let me illustrate this by a quotation from the journal of Mensa, a so-called high IQ society that, that, that was founded in Great Britain in the late 1940s. In the first number of the Mensa magazine, the question of defining intelligence turned out to be a rather rhetorical one. <coughs> what is intelligence? Psychologists debate this question until their definitions become too complex for comprehension and, and too indecisive for meaning. Test constructors spent 10 years on the perfection of a yardstick for measuring intelligence. And then everyone spends the next 10 years in casting workbeds of criticism at the laborious construction. Educational authorities adopt this or that test in order to allot the children under their care to appropriate secondary schools, and no one, parent, child, or teacher, is satisfied with the results. So it would appear that intelligence is something too abstract and too abstruse for us to be able to grasp. So far, I think most of us would follow the author. He denies the possibility to define and measure intelligence and stresses the contested nature of the concept itself. But then the author continues with a rather surprising statement. Yet, when we meet our fellow men, how quickly we can place them into one of the two classes, the intelligent and the rest. It takes but a short time and a brief conversation for one of the first category to classify his fellows, and what an alarmingly small number can be firmly placed in category one. <coughs> um, I won't comment on this, but rather rephrase the whole thing in an analytical way. For me, what this quotation does is to highlight that the reference to intelligence can have a social function, and that is, it can be used to distinguish entities relative to intelligence, it can be used to make classifications, and if I phrase it in a more general way, it can be used in practices of undoing, of doing and undoing differences. This means the reference to intelligence is used in practices of producing and contesting difference as an ongoing interaction and accomplishment. Intelligence, therefore, can be seen as a means of forming socio-political distinctions.
These courses and practices of undoing difference are at the analytical center of my research project. It is most fascinating that, since the late 19th century, debates about intelligence have been intertwined with various modes of creating difference and assigning social positions. Most obviously, reference to intelligence served to distinguish human individuals from each other. With the advent of modern psychology and mental testing in the late 19th century, interest in the diagnosis and description of human differences by reference to intelligence increased. Inspired by the research of scholars such as Francis Galton or William Stern, the late 19th and early 20th century saw the rise of intelligence as a conceptual whole. Intelligence now became an attribute that individuals possess to different degrees. Particularly the development of mental testing and quantifying intelligence diagnostics contributed to creating relations between human individuals that often were characterized by notions of hierarchy. Quantification, comparing and ranking now became basic practices of social positioning based on reference to intelligence. I illustrate this with a caricature from the 1960s. The drawing, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the drawing was published in the Times Educational Review and it picks up on a publication which had stated that the IQ of science dons in Cambridge was much lower than expected. The small scene depicts two pupils at the school. They are looking at their teacher and comment, if the dons at Cambridge have a lower IQ, imagine what theirs are like. For me, this drawing illustrates how reference to intelligence was used to evaluate and to rank people, to make comparisons and to articulate social judgments, not least based on social assumptions of how a person's intelligence ought to be, considering the group of people to which he or she belongs. Attributions and evaluations of intelligence were also frequently coupled with statements about social stratification and class formation. This association between ascriptions of intelligence and social stratification becomes evident in statements about the intelligence of the lower classes. It can be seen in discussions about the potential divergence of intelligence between classes or between different professional and occupational groups as in this example. On the left, we see IQ points from 140 to 90. Each IQ range is associated with certain occupational groups. The list is arranged strictly hierarchical. On the top of the list, we find the higher professionals, top civil servants, professors, and research scientists. At the bottom of the list, we find, for instance, laborers and gardeners with an indicated mean IQ of about 90. The association between intelligence and social stratification also surfaces in debates on social mobility by means of intelligence. <coughs> Not least, the debate about intelligence has often overlapped with discussions about social inequality and social justice. For many, many of these interconnections can be discovered in this book cover. It's a German translation of Richard Hernstein's IQ and the Meritocracy. Uh, if we translate this title back to English, it now reads Equal Chances, a Utopia? Question mark, a class society determined by a Q. In the picture, we can see a white man that seems to be hovering above a crowd. For me, this graphical representation stresses the forming of social hierarchies and the social elevation of some individuals by means of intelligence. At the same time, it questions the acceptability and legitimacy of the mode of social positioning it evokes. The discourse of intelligence also coincided with aspects of social ordering that are not quite covered by aspects of social class formation. For example, it informed the discussion around positionings legitimized by categories such as gender and race. As an example, I'm showing you the cover of a leaflet issued by a socialist group in the 1970s. Especially in Great Britain during the 60s to 80s, problems of discrimination against certain ethnic groups and migrant communities, as well as the just assignment of social positions, were discussed along with the controversies surrounding intelligence and intelligence diagnostics. On the cover, we can see white and black heads. It's important to know that it are heads only, uh, what happens very often in this uh, kind of um, illustrations. Um, and the heads are sh shown without a body. These heads are assembled beyond two large boots with the inscri inscription I and Q. 
if you compare this book cover with the one shown before, this one, um, it is interesting to note how similarly they use spatial positionings to discuss aspects of social stratification and social justice. Social hierarchies are reflected as spatial hierarchies, and social inequality is represented by imaginations of elevation and subordination. Even non-human entities, such as animals and machines, were ranked and arranged in debates about intelligence. Since the late 19th century, post-Darwinist animal psychology has sparked debates about animal intelligence and the model of a steady upward progression from animals to humans. Scientific discussions about animal intelligence reverberated in more popular debates, such as controversies surrounding clever dogs or horses that talk count of right. In the second half of the 20th century, discussions about artificial intelligence intensified. This debate, similarly to the earlier one about animal intelligence, reveals a degree of ontological uneasiness in the face of separate conceptual treatments of human and other intelligent entities. Here exemplified by the question, will we still be alone at the end of the 20th century, or will we have a technical twin? All in all, these examples stress that since the late 19th century, debates about intelligence have been intertwined with various modes of creating difference and of assigning social positions. Given these interconnections, the history of intelligence offers a methodological opportunity to venture from a, social, from a history of social inequality, that means a history between persons, towards a broader history of social practices surrounding categorization and the assigning of social positions. Based on the assumption that intelligence took on social importance precisely because knowledge about it transcended expert circles, the study particularly focuses on debates played out within the public sphere. This focus is reflected in the type of sources which I selected for this project. One major type of sources are publicly well received publications that can be used to describe popular knowledge about intelligence. This includes newspapers and journals, but also materials such as intelligence training publications and IQ self-test literature. I'm showing you here two examples of such self-test literature. The left one was published uh, in Germany in the 1920s. It encouraged people to test uh, their own intelligence and to draw their ingenogram, that is to draw a graphic representation of their intelligence and their abilities. The other one, Hans Eising's Know Your Own IQ, was published in Great Britain in the early 1960s. Although there had been earlier publications of a similar kind, this one was the first which promised that it could be used to actually assess and quantify one's own intelligence quotient, and it was quite popular at the time of its publication and was published in many subsequent editions. Furthermore, as sources, I study letters to the editor. First, this is important to include more voices in the history of intelligence, for instance, female voices who are largely underrepresented in the scientific debate and in monographic publications. Second, letters to the editor allow us to include concrete situations of speaking and writing about intelligence in general and of discourses and practices of undoing difference. The project also examines caricatures. This is particularly important to cover non-conventional knowledge about intelligence. I assume that there are debates that are articulated in caricature and irony that wouldn't have been possible, for instance, in scientific publications, and I'm trying to include such debates that, for instance, address issues that are beyond political correctness. Finally, I include archival material, and namely archival collections by scientists and educationists who are interested in popular debates about intelligence. To enable a con consistent analysis, I have drafted a list of questions that guides the interpretation of sources. These questions are also available to facilitate the comparison between Germany and Great Britain. Um, so these are the um, five uh, levels of analysis um, with which I approach the sources. The project pursues a comparative approach because, in addition to analyzing the production of difference and hierarchies, it also investigates interdependencies and intersections between various levels of undoing difference that may not have been verbalized in contemporary discourse. The project covers a time frame of 
about 100 years, so it's necessary to structure it very clearly. I've decided to use case studies to ensure the project is manageable. Um, this is how the whole thing could look when it is finished, but uh, could also be otherwise, we'll see. But at the moment, I think it could like look like this. So it begins with debates about human-animal distinction in the late 19th century. Contrary to most studies on human intelligence that normally started about 1900, the focus on the late 19th century stresses the debates about animal intelligence and comparative psychology preceded the evolution of modern intelligence diagnostics and discussions about human intelligence. Therefore, in th this introductory case study, I discuss popular debates about animal intelligence in the late 19th century and evaluate the implications for the then developing interpretations of human intelligence and human difference. The second case study describes debates about intelligence, social inequality, and social mobility from about 1900 to about 1945. Comparing debates about intelligence in both countries, this case study evaluates political and social aspects of intelligence in the first third of the 20th century. Particularly after the First World War, intelligence testing was first employed in practical contexts, such as elections for schools and in scholarship examinations, and intelligence was also discussed in controversies about social mobility and human equality. The third case study evaluates the relation between intelligence and debates about the intelligence of the people or the folk. It analyzes which role reference to intelligence played in racist and eugenicist discussions, and particularly examines practices and discourses of undoing difference related to them. The case study focuses on the time between 1900 and 1945 in Great Britain and 1900 and 1933 in Germany. This is the case because I discuss the Nazi period in a separate chapter. The fourth case study therefore concentrates on Germany only. It shows how, on the one hand, the perfection of intellectual capacities remained an implicit goal in National Socialism. But on the other hand, intellectual capacities, and namely intelligence and intelligence testing, were dismissed as being Jewish and a threat to health and corporal strength. This does not imply that intelligence testing became obsolete during the so-called Third Reich. For instance, intelligence testing was used in processes following the Erbgesundheitsgesetz that led to compulsory sterilizations. After the Second World War, the association between social and political orders and discourses and practices of undoing difference showed yet in other variations. Um, in both West Germany and Great Britain, social movements attacked intelligence testing as unjust and unfair. In the early years of the German Democratic Republic, intelligence testing was completely banned due to a verdict by the Soviet Union banning mental testing in the 1920s. Only from the late 1960s onwards, mental testing became to be accepted again in the eastern part of Germany, ironically at a time when socialist groups in the West began to intensify the struggle against mental testing again. Even though West Germany was a latecomer in research about artificial intelligence, machine intelligence was a popular topic in, for instance, newspapers and mainstream journal articles. In Great Britain and Germany, the technical possibility and social implications of intelligent machines were widely discussed. In the center of this debate, we find the human-machine distinction and the question how men, that is humans, and machines will be separated from each other in the future, and what and how makes them different from each other. This already brings me to the end of this presentation, and I want to address only one more question and already apologize for doing so, because it's a big one. Um, so far, I, I have only talked about the history of intelligence, and I want to add three more arguments why this study could be relevant beyond its specialist focus. I assume that in addition to its multidisciplinary perspectives, the project will contribute to several broader debates in his geography and the humanities in general. The project aims to write a social history that does not tacitly set its su subject, the social, beyond scrutiny, but instead reflects upon it. In contrast to the literature of the 1970s and 1980s that rather focused on structural aspects, it enables us to consider to what extent we might gain insights by addressing equ equality and inequality as stabilized or destabilized in concrete situations of undoing difference. 
This means it reflects possible ways of dealing with the phenomenon of equality and inequality. Not least, the project will add to the, to the debate about the political character of knowledge production. It particularly explores how non-expert knowledge, power and politics interact in public and popular discourses. With regard to the topic of this panel, individuals and social political orders, the project explores how social distinctions are made and contested in everyday situations of undoing difference. It therefore tries to identify micro-political forces from which social and societal order emerges. And this might also be a path to explore connections between the research projects pursued by my fellow panelists. And I'm very much looking forward to your comments and critique. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. The next speaker is, uh, we will take uh, questions at the end, so everybody will have a chance to intervene at that point. I beg your pardon? Yes, yes, well, okay, but very brief one. Yes, please. Yeah, it's true. Um, this is a rough um, estimation of, of date. I um, stop at, at the end of the Cold War, so uh, it's late 80s, 1985, uh, so it's, it's not a pre precise date. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker will be Sonja Leumann, and she is a fellow at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. And normally she's based at Simon Fraser University, which is one of the two major universities in Vancouver. And she works on very interesting things concerning memory, memorizing, and how those, how that is related to practices, um, well, religious and normative practices. And specifically, her focus is on an ethnographic study of uh, anti-abortion activism and the Orthodox Church in Russia. <coughs> But you also, I mean, I should mention, you come out of this very famous program, actually, on anthropology and history at the University of Michigan, which is one of the few places where that is the main priority, a very important one. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I want to join everyone else in thanking the organizers and the, the URIAS program for making this whole gathering possible. Um, and yes, um, I think by way of making a connection to the overall topic of this panel, uh, my starting question is, how do everyday decisions become politicized? And what happens when past decisions retroactively acquire moral weight? The example with which I'm studying <laughs> these questions is um, the issue of abortion in Russia, uh, which was a completely normalized, if unpleasant, form of fertility control for generations of Soviet couples. Legalized first in 1920 and then again after some restrictions um, in 1955, abortion is still available on demand and free during first trimester in post-Soviet Russia and by medical indication and uh, a small number of social indications at later stages. And it is also widely accepted by Russian citizens when we go by survey results. Um, there has been over the past years a growth of an anti-abortion movement, mainly within the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, in 2012, um, there was the founding of a patriarchal commission um, on affairs of the family and protection of motherhood. And also since about 2012, every diocese needs to have a priest or a lay person who is in charge of these issues of um, fertility, demography, motherhood, family. Um, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow has actually changed his own public position on the issue just over the course of the last summer, uh, when previously he talked about abortion as a sin but was against banning it legally. There is now a, um, a version of an ongoing signature drive to actually ban abortion that has received the blessing of the patriarchate. So there's been a shift quite recently in sort of the, the official position of the state hierarchy. 
Um, the results of kind of legislative initiatives to restrict abortion so far have been mixed and not terribly successful. Um, but the topic, abortion, childbirth, birth, family, has certainly, when we look at kind of the interior church politics, moved from the margins to the center of the church's concerns itself in terms of social outreach. And it's also receiving much more kind of public visibility in Russia in general. Um, I'm an anthropologist, as Bjorn already said, with some historical training. And um, I look at this movement mainly through uh, an ethnographic study of activist groups. Um, I also consider it in comparison and contrast with pro-life activism in North America and elsewhere, um, and within this overall context of issues of memory, memorialization, commemoration. Um, in this presentation, I will spe pay special attention to the concept of valuing human life, uh, which in the post-Soviet context, I will argue, is a bit less banal than it is, for instance, in the US, um, and also on issues of memory. How do women re-evaluate decisions they made in the past based on new political circumstances? Why are aborted fetuses becoming grievable life, to use a term from Judith Butler, at a time when the question of how to grieve other lives lost in Russia's 20th century is still very much up for grabs? Um, and <coughs> throughout the presentation, you'll also have a chance to see that kind of the visual culture of this movement is actually quite different and visual representations particularly of aborted fetuses are quite different from what you may be familiar with from kind of Western um, pro-life activism. That life in Russia is not generally valued, and human life in particular, is a common complaint for liberal as well as conservative critics. Um, for example, in January 2012, the liberal news magazine Aganyok reported on the accidental death of a toddler in Bryansk, a Russian city, who together with his 26-year-old mother fell through the concrete paving of the city's central square into the sewage system because a defective concrete tube collapsed under their feet. Um, bystanders saved the mother, literally kind of pulling her out, but the toddler was carried off by the current of wastewater and was found dead the following day. The article traced the story of corruption and neglect that had kept the sewage tubing in Bryansk from being replaced for many years and asked, how can we live in cities where the ground can be pulled from under your feet at any moment? The article noted with satisfaction that there had been some reactions from the city administration in the wake of the little boy's death. A case of missing schoolgirls elicited swift reactions from the police, and a court case involving a young driver who had killed a three-year-old at a pedestrian uh, crossing was suddenly treated with some priority. And um, the final sentence of the article is, I quote, that's how miraculously the attitude to children has changed and how steeply the value of human life has grown in the eyes of the city's officials. I read this article in another provincial Russian city, Kazan, at the home of an elderly family friend who pointed it out to me as yet another example that in Russia anything could happen, human life had no value, and there was no place that was really safe, and most importantly, those in power would always put monetary interests above the safety of the population. I was moved by her points about life's vulnerability, but also struck by the parallels between this liberal critique of Russian society and the views of the conservative Christian pro-natalist activists, among whom I was doing research. Russians of many professional and ideological backgrounds tend to link the theme of human life and its purported lack of value in Russia to recent and more remote history. Um, for example, in his analysis of the Chechen war, the anthropologist and one-time advisor to Boris Yeltsin, um, Valery Tishkov, concludes in a quote from Tishkov's book on Chechnya, that the war was the price paid for the low value placed on human life. We inherited this value from the past, and it persists to this day in Russian society. On the more conservative end of the spectrum, the Council of Bishops of the Russian Orthodox Church emphasizes in its statements on the dignity, freedom, and, human ri and rights of the human person that the dignity of a human being comes from being created in the image and likeness of God, implying that decades of state-enforced atheism prevented Russians from absorbing this value and living it out fully. Um, and here you can see another kind of theological statement um, from one of my research participants that tries to 
to both formulate the value of life but also um, give it kind of a theological twist that's somewhat different from uh, from kind of valuing of, of human life as such. Abortion activists such as this Sergei, whom I'm quoting here, whom I met, drew parallels between Soviet history and what they saw as a prevailing option for abortion among health professionals. No person, no problem, is our friend likes to summarize what she sees as a pervasive attitude among doctors who reportedly push for an abortion in, in the face of rather slight health problems in the pregnancy. Um, and she links this attitude to the heritage of Stalinism, this idea of, you know, the person is gone, the problem is gone. Uh, the diagnosis overall that, that one hears from several sides of Russian society is reminiscent of the one posed by the psychoanalysts Margarete and Alexander Mitchellich in post-war Germany, and that is where my title comes from, from the inability to mourn. Um, according to the, to the Mitchellichs, the inability to respect the dignity of others and oneself comes from the inability to mourn for the victims of political oppression and also for the false enthusiasm that fueled these oppressions and repressions. Anti-abortion activists in today's Russia see themselves as opposing this culture of death that they see, for instance, embodied in these kinds of um, statistics of abortion ratios that you can see um, were quite high, especially in the late Soviet period. Um, <coughs> so they see uh, themselves as kind of opposing this culture of death which a new respect with a new respect for human life as embodied by children growing up in virtuous Christian families. Uh, for them, the large numbers of aborted fetuses in Russia are not symbols of the universal sanctity of human life, but are part of a larger category of demographic losses, which include the victims of the war, the gulag, and famines, and together get conceptualized mainly as a loss to the nation, so to the overall kind of body of of a healthy nation, both in terms of quantity and quality. So the argument is that kind of, um, through this history of political repressions, it's actually the best people who have been lost in a way. Um, uh, so statistics is one way of visualizing that. Another way of, of visualizing this equation of aborted fetuses with demographic loss um, is in the visual culture of this movement and um, a very nice example is this kind of one-minute video which won a prize in 2012 for public service advertising. Oh, and actually I should not do it this way, but do it this way. Um, so this is a kind of a student project from Kamchatka um, that was submitted to a Russia-wide competition and, as I said, won. And um, there's some sound, but it's only very melodramatic music, so the focus is really the, the visual. I will see if I can... Is there a way to turn up the sound a little bit? Or is it here? No. This just means, and what if your mother had had an abortion? Um, so you get the point, right? The, these black and white children are um, the aborted children that these couples purportedly would have had if they, um, if they hadn't had abortions. Um. Okay. Um. So part of what interests me about this movement is that in constituting fetuses as grievable specters, abortion activists actually depart from a general trend not to mourn the Soviet past or the past in general in Russia that has been noted by many observers. Um, 
for example, by David Satter in his kind of tellingly entitled book, It Was a Long Time Ago and It Never Happened Anyway, which is a book about the way that Russia is dealing with Stalinist repressions currently. Um, Alexander Atkind, in his book entitled Warped Morning, um, is taking a somewhat more nuanced approach. And he has argued that in a context where official discourse uh, increasingly discourages any critical rethinking of the Soviet period, popular impulses to process the massive deaths and repressions of Soviet history have shifted to the realm of literature and film. Here they express themselves in a fascination with death, fantastic disappearances, vampirism, and other forms of what Etkin calls magical historicism. So he's saying that this is actually kind of a genre of, of literature and film in Russia today, magical historicism. Uh, while this approach is evocative, and in some ways I think that maybe these popular expressions of kind of anti-abortion activism might be part of that in some way, um, Etkin, I think, also runs into a problem common to some parts of memory studies. The tendency to juxtapose oppressive, incomplete official history official history with heroic, resistant, popular memory. Um, and something that I, a concept that I try to use to kind of break down this distinction a little bit is the idea of vernacular memory, which I'm ad ad adapting from Jenny White's concept of vernacular politics. Um, and um, what distinguishes this idea of kind of vernacular memory from this heroic oppositional idea of memory is that vernacular memory is not necessarily opposed to official history, uh, but it's a popular kind of processing of historical narratives that might come from official sources such as media or school books. Um, so it feeds off key official themes and elaborates, but also sometimes contests these official discourses. Um, different from heroic memory, vernacular memory might refer to different key temporal landmarks. Um, so it's not so much the gulag that ca came up in a lot of my interviews, but more the Brezhnev era in the 1990s, so times that are more within living memory. Um, and then maybe World War II and pre-revolutionary Russia as more remote kind of mythical times where life was different and people were better and more virtuous and such. Um, there are also different key topics that come up, not so much political repressions, but more kind of these everyday compromises that people have made in the name of, kind of living within a system. Um, and kind of most, um, uh, most relevant to reproductive decision making is compromises people made in the name of, of what some sociologists have called the gendered citizenship of the working mother who had to limit her fertility in the interest of also being productive in the workplace. Um, so I think that reproductive decisions take an important place in vernacular memory because they expressed a contradiction that, a contradiction that was already internal to Soviet gender politics, uh, the contradiction between the cult of motherhood and the cult of the woman worker, which every woman kind of had to negotiate. And they were also an area of kind of relative freedom, so there was no campaign of forced abortions, as in China, for instance, there was nobody forced a woman to limit her fertility, like, legally, um, but it was more a, a way of kind of balancing conflicting demands. Um, so it becomes an area where people do have feelings of personal responsibility and also where they can look back at life decisions and kind of make them a focus of kind of might have been imaginary exercises of what would my life be like if I had four children instead of two, or if my children were spaced differently or something. Um, and then also reproductive decisions came up, come, come up in this vernacular memory and become a topic because they are increasingly a, a, um, a subject of current um, political debate. Um, activists see themselves as standing in opposition to the state which permits and finances abortion. They also see themselves as opposed to the church hierarchy, which the more radical among them see as being too conciliatory to the current legal situation in the state. Uh, many activists I met have terminated pregnancies themselves and practice activism as a kind of penance. Uh, younger generations of activists who have not necessarily had that personal experience take up activism because the language of demographic loss resonates with their mediated experience and creates a bridge for them between living and dead generations. 
between trends that they see in their family and larger social trends. All activists take out a position that's actually quite difficult to inhabit in today's Russia, which is that of the loyal patriotic critic of the status quo, which is not something that Russian politics necessarily recognizes. Um, as part of their activism, there are also new ritual practices that emerge where aborted fetuses of the past are mourned as victims. And they're often represented, as you saw in the video, as spectral children rather than the kind of bloodied, mangled icons of life itself of North American abortion activism. Um, so to finish, I just want to briefly uh, make three points about what are the objects that are actually being mourned in this kind of new practice of mourning? And what are the threats that these acts of mourning are meant to warn against? Um, and the first object is the patriarchal family and a lost naturalized gender order. Um, so the object of warning would here be any kind of leveling of what these activists see as natural um, gender differences. Um, and as you see also, uh, there's a very close interrelationship between this anti-abortion activism and movements against homosexuality in Russia today, kind of homophobic expressions. Um, another object of mourning is the fetus as a potential relative, um, someone who would be part of a kin group as well as a, na as a national group. Um, so here the warning is against these kind of um, with this ongoing danger of kind of depopulation that people see, um, but also against a certain kind of westernization where they see that traditional Russian values are being undermined. Um, for some activists, the object of mourning is actually something somewhat bigger, because it is the entirely pre-revolutionary political order, which was destroyed in their view by the foundational act of patricide, um, which was the killing of Tsar Nicholas II with his family. So these are monarchists um, participating in an, um, a penitential uh, pilgrimage, actually, that commemorates abortion. Um, and so for these monarchist trends in the movement, all Soviet and post-Soviet evil followed from this kind of foundational act of, kind of destroying the legitimate social order. Um, so the warning here would be against any kind of sudden social change, um, any kind of revolutionary activity. Um, and to close, I would just want to say that my overall guess from observing the dynamics of this movement over the past six, seven years or so is that the ritualization and memorialization of abortion will mainly be a generational phenomenon among women and men who had their reproductive years during the Soviet period and also the immediate post-Soviet era when abortion ratios were very high. Um, but the issue of these intergenerational effects of demographi demographic developments seems likely to enthrall Russia's public imagination for some time to come, and it will be maybe be kind of the, the larger issue that this movement will turn out to be of a small aspect of. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Extremely interesting presentations. And there is a much more of a semantic coherence than I ever dared hope for. Uh, the, uh, the third speaker this morning will be Leszek Kostanovic, and we are met in Helsinki, of course. And he is a pr fellow at the Collegium, the, the, um, the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, professor of philosophy at the famous Warsaw School of Social Science and Humanities, and has worked extensively on the politics of the social, the constitution of this, constituting <coughs> the social, as we've heard here also and on everyday life, and the politics of everyday life. So I know you draw a lot on American pragmatism, but also Bakhtini and theorizing about dialogues, and you link that to theorizing totalitarianism. I don't know if you'll do that here now, but that, that's, that's quite original, actually. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, I, oh, I would like to close this. Uh, so in meantime, uh, <laughs> my university got the 
uh, distinguished name of official name of university. It is the first uh, private university in Poland, so the name is a little bit different. University of Social Sciences and Humanities, but we we still uh, have this uh, FUPS, which is uh, uh, Warsaw School of Social Psychology, as a kind of uh, uh, respect to our past. Uh, so I will uh, present my uh, research project and some uh, developments I did in the uh, fabulous uh, environment of Helsinki College for advanced uh, uh, study. And uh, but first, I would like to start with a kind of a self-promotion, but it is self-promotion uh, justify, I hope, because in fact this book is going to be the third part of the trilogy. Politics of time, politics of dialogue, and uh, this is a politics of everyday life. Because in this free book I tried to find uh, some relations uh, between uh, everyday life of uh, people and, how to say, uh, macrocosmos of uh, politics. The first book was devoted to the discussion on communist part in uh, past in Poland. The second book is more theoretical. It is about uh, possibility of dialogue in uh, in uh, democracy. So uh, I would like to close this uh, this uh, my discussion of uh, relation between uh, dialogue, uh, everyday life, and politics with the third book, Politics of um, Everyday uh, Life. And as uh, I was, it was said in the introduction. Uh, this is my uh, this is my background. So in politics of dialogue, I use extensively uh, Mikhail Bakhtin uh, concept of uh, dialogue. Uh, but this uh, Bakhtin, of course, is well known in uh, literature in cultural studies. But I use this for politics. Politics. Bakhtin never uh, written about uh, uh, politics for different reasons, and there's a discussion about experts' way, of course, the totalitarian Stalinist state, but also maybe he, uh, he condemned politics. For him, the existential dimension was the most important, and politics was just a surface of what uh, is happening uh, in the social uh, or cultural, uh, cultural life. But what is the, the most uh, important uh, for, my, for my current project? that Bakhtin um, differentiate between dialogical relations, which are everywhere, and a real dialogue. Dialogical uh, relations are everywhere, and of course, even the most totalitarian sta state cannot uh, survive without uh, dialogue. But, of course, the problem for me is, and I, I, I concern this book in this, in this problem in these two previous books, how this... Um, this uh, Everyday dialogue can be translated or uh, into into political uh, political dialogue. This uh, also uh, what uh, is uh, was said. Uh, I am uh, interested. I was for many years scholar of American uh, pragmatism. So for me, democracy. I accept uh, this uh, Duyan concept of democracy, not as an institution, not as a procedure, but as a, a system of habits. I call this using a little bit Wittgensteinian, uh, Wittgensteinian uh, <laughs> uh, reference, democracy as a form of life. So democracy, from my point of view, is not uh, institution, is a form of life in the sense uh, uh, of Wittgensteinian sense, but Wittgensteinian, of course, took this from uh, Spengler, from, uh, from German uh, philosopher. And the third uh, background, or third motives in background, is democracy's universalization of everyday uh, life uh, uh, interactions. This is a George Herbert myth. I work uh, in American pragmatics, I, I did uh, mainly uh, work on uh, George Herbert uh, myth, and I admire his uh, Mm, ability to connect uh, some social psychology, uh, so, uh, social psychology, so, sociology, and uh, philosophy in one unified uh, theory. And uh, in mind, service and society, there is an interesting concept of uh, democracy, which is usually overlooked because people uh, who are interested in uh, in this in his work are uh, 
looking at the self uh, formation of the self and so on. But he uh, he wrote in this uh, in this uh, chapter that democracy is universal universalization of uh, uh, some uh, other things. So first, uh, of course, economy. Uh, you you have to uh, put yourself in the uh, place of the other, and also religion uh, to start think about uh, your neighbor as uh, equal to you, uh, and also to some uh, extent is um, a universalization of uh, communal interaction. So this is a uh, this is a point of departure for my own uh, work. Here, a research question which I put in my uh, project that I am trying to resolve in my, uh, in my uh, work. Uh, how uh, the relationship between the sphere politic and everyday life, uh, opposed or uh, connected, uh, dif difference, uh, historic historical and cultural difference, but mainly I am interested in looking at totalitarian or authoritarian uh, state, which I uh, used to live, in which I used to live for half of my uh, life, and uh, democratic uh, politics, in which I am living uh, uh, happily now. Uh, and uh, Contradiction, and uh, I, am, I am especially interested in the resistance in totalitarian state in everyday life. How it was possible to uh, to resist uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 totalitarianism. Sonia told about this a very complicated compromise and networks uh, uh, we we needed to uh, to make to survive in the uh, communist uh, time. So I am especially interested how this. Uh, a complicated uh, network of uh, relations uh, affect uh, politics because uh, one of the um, uh, disadvantages of looking at the totalitarian or authoritarian state, at least I was born in 1954, uh, so I knew only not you know, very aggressive Stalinist uh, communist, but uh, how to say, degenerated uh, Gierek and uh, Jaruzelski uh, communist, uh, communist state. But one of the dis disadvantages is that uh, many people uh, look at the totalitarian state, especially late communists, through the eyes of Hannah Arendt and her concept of a total control of individual, which was not true. I mean uh, that uh, we needed a lot of uh, the personal uh, family connections and state uh, even didn't uh, try to control uh, this but there is a very interesting uh, problem how they um, uh, uh, how they uh, uh, could be harmonized with uh, with the politics uh, and of course experience of everyday uh, life which is everydayness in fact uh, which is uh, uh, very important for my uh, my uh, project and then uh, as a political, as a philosophical uh, project, this project is um, uh, connected with the distinction between politics and the political. La politique and la politique in, uh, in, uh, in French, which is a very, uh, very popular now. And what is the interesting, that uh, so many p different people like Schmidt, Arendt, uh, Claude Lefort, Paul Ricoeur, Chantal Mouffe, uh, contemporary um, uh, political uh, theorist, used extensively this, uh, this, uh, this uh, distinction. And what I uh, found uh, uh, even dangerous, I would say dangerous, in this, in this uh, distinction is that this distinction is motivated by the dream of pure politics. Politics which wouldn't be, uh, how to say, damaged or infected with everyday life, with economy and so on, like in Arendt you know, to be uh, like a Greek agon, discussing ideas and so on. And I think, of course, this is a beautiful, and of course the nasty version of this is in Schmidt, uh, this distinction that politics is defined by the uh, uh, friend-enemy uh, distinction. But, uh, but it is the same motivation, like the politics, something which is above uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, everydayness. So this uh, this distinction is 
I would say target of my uh, critic, or should be target of my critic in, in my research uh, project. This is uh, quite clear. I think that the first uh, person who wrote about uh, this distinction was a French, uh, no, very uh, famous uh, uh, philosopher, uh, Paul Ricoeur, who wrote an um, uh, article, The Political Paradox, which was his response to the uh, uh, Soviet invasion uh, on Hungary in uh, 1956. And in this, uh, this uh, paper he discussed, and what is the most important for me, is that uh, entice the bridge between the citizen abstract life and the concrete life of the family and of uh, work, which also I uh, don't uh, accept, but of course I uh, appreciate his uh, argumentation and his uh, um, opposition to the, uh, to the Soviet uh, imperialism. Uh, so, the second uh, distinction which is uh, interesting uh, for me, it is a distinction politics, politicization. And this is uh, also, I would say, dangerous uh, distinctions because it is probably a kind of uh, uh, effect of the reading of Michel Foucault concept of power. So then, uh, a lot of people say everything is political. Politics is everywhere. And if politics is everywhere, sexuality is everywhere, uh, I don't know, food is everywhere and so on. If politics is everywhere, it's nowhere. So this is a problem how we can, uh, uh, how we can uh, distinguish beque between uh, politics and, uh, uh, and uh, 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 and, uh, how to say, everyday life, but not uh, getting in trap of uh, of uh, this kind of sweeping uh, politiz politization uh, concept, and then of course politics, uh, famous uh, Habermas, uh, distinguish between uh, disting uh, distinction between public sphere and political sphere and Hannah Arendt uh, private sphere and public sphere. Uh, so I, I am trying to find uh, to say third way between these two uh, two distinction. Uh, this is uh, one of the possibility to mm, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to make uh, this uh, concept of power uh, versus uh, politicization uh, uh, sensible, and it is from the recent book by uh, my friend Hans Sluga, who started as an analytic philosopher writing about uh, Frege, but now is now published an interesting book about uh, Foucault Arendt um, uh, on uh, and, uh, and Schmidt, uh, and he tried to make uh, this. Uh, he tried to, according to his uh, glorious uh, uh, analytic uh, training, he, he tried to show distinction between uh, politics <coughs> and uh, uh, power in the in Foucaultian in Foucaultian uh, sense. Uh, so, uh, what I said, uh, I am interested in, uh, in uh, mm, politics, uh, mm, politics, uh, uh, everyday life and politics in totalitarian, authoritarian uh, state. And here there is a, a quotation with a with book I like. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, Jeff Goldfarb, um, a professor at New School for Social Research in New York City, and he was an um, observer of Polish uh, politics from early 70s. And he uh, went several times uh, to Poland during the communist time, and he observed uh, everyday, in fact, everyday life uh, opposition to uh, to communist. And what is the interesting in this book, Politics of Small uh, Things? It is a s <laughs> also a small book, <laughs> like uh, like the title. Uh, but uh, what is the interesting that he mm, uh, tried in this book uh, show to show uh, how you know such events like you know uh, friends gathering in the kitchen discussing politics or cultural events, on promotion of book. He went, in fact, he went to my city several uh, times, to Wrocław, 
because in 70s we had a uh, open theater festival in 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 this city and um, the the guy who who organized this invited the best uh, theaters from the world bread and pa bread and puppet and so on and so on so there was a, like a presentation of the contemporary uh, at the time uh, theater and probably communism uh, communist uh, motivation for uh, agreement was that they uh, thought that you know of course bread the paper was very opposed to vietnam war and so on so to show how uh, terrible is american imperialism but for people it was first experience you know this was a state theater so being together dancing and so on and so on and also to open the space for uh, for critique but of course nothing happened there was no demonstration political demonstration afterwards but uh, I think uh, that these uh, cultural events could change uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, some, uh, some everyday life uh, relation could uh, change uh, political cl climate which influenced um, uh, these famous strikes in 1980 and uh, rise of, uh, the rise of uh, solidarity movement. And this is the second example which is my favorite. There was a theater very interesting theater, uh, it was called uh, Orange Alternative in Wrocław in the 80s. And what was characteristic for this uh, theater? That they organized kind of uh, ironic events. For instance, they organized, uh, you know, there was a, a 80s, so time of solidarity movement and people went through the streets, uh, uh, down with communists, long life, solidarity. Not, not them. They organized, for instance, Day of policemen. They, uh, they, they, they came to streets with the slogans, we, <laughs> we demand rise of uh, salaries for secret police agents. Their work is so difficult and so on. And of course they were arrested. Po police didn't know how to, how to react. They were, uh, they were arrested, but they said to me that uh, policemen said, oh, this is a very good slogan. We really need, uh, <laughs> and so on. And for instance, they uh, they uh, they organized uh, they organized uh, illegal uh, celebration of October Revolution. They uh, they, uh, they 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 used uh, red crosses. They went to street, uh, chanting uh, revolutionary uh, songs and so on and so on. And police arrested everybody who had anything uh, red, you know, even scarf and so on. So so this is, uh, of course, it was uh, 80s, so uh, the communist regime was not so, how to say, dangerous. I mean, he was still dangerous, he was still uh, mighty, but, uh, but there was uh, the, 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 the sign, but, uh, the sign of uh, no new things coming, for, for, for sure. But anyway, uh, it was the interesting, interesting like the mm, uh, uh, example of opposition using uh, culture more than uh, political mm, political uh, slogans. Okay, so uh, uh, so to my theoretical. So I would say that uh, if I look and I, I I had time in Helsinki to look and the rich tradition of using uh, everyday life and uh, interpose everyday life with politics, I would say that there are two main uh, approaches critic of everyday life. I put here because he is the most probably famous, Henri Lefebvre, uh, 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 French uh, sociologist, Marxist sociologist, but of course this tradition coming mainly from uh, Marxist tradition. There is a Marxian tradition. There is a famous book by Engels about the situation of working class in uh, Great uh, Britain. There are uh, uh, moving passages in um, uh, Marx manuscripts, but also in uh, Capital. Uh, when uh, and this approach is to look at everyday life as a symptoms, as a symptom of something deeper. So let's say Marx in the uh, in uh, manuscripts show that uh, everyday life of working class is in fact animal life, that their real life is uh, beyond their everyday life and uh, is work and so on and so on. And, uh, and of course it was, uh, there is a, a long tradition uh, because uh, Marxian activists in 19th century and uh, 20th century look at an everyday life 
uh, as a kind of limitation to uh, political activity of working class. There is, of course, this famous thesis that uh, Lenin's thesis that uh, uh, Revolutionary Party had to impose uh, impose uh, uh, revolutionary consciousness on uh, working class because otherwise working class is able only to develop trade union activity. The same uh, motives we, you can find in uh, Karkowski and so on and so on. And uh, and uh, this is a still important uh, tradition. Uh, for instance, uh, there are some in Lukacs, for instance, in Lukacs, uh, Georgi Luk Lukacs, Georgi Lukacs uh, school, uh, there is a, a very interesting uh, book written in the uh, 60s by uh, his students, uh, Agnes uh, Heller, now, uh, now he's retired, but he, she was professor in the United uh, States about structure of everyday life and so on. But uh, uh, I am uh, much more interested in the emerging uh, concept uh, which I uh, called uh, critique from everyday life, like uh, everyday life as a basis for critique. And for this, uh, for the theoretization of this, I use uh, Lig Boltański, a contemporary uh, French uh, sociologist, who tried to show how uh, human agenda can uh, change uh, in, in his sociology of critique, as opposed to uh, critical sociology developed, let's say, for Bourdieu, uh, uh, by Bourdieu, uh, he, he, he tried to show how everyday life experience can uh, become a basis for, uh, for uh, social, uh, social uh, critique. Of course, he's, uh, he's sure that this um, everyday life critique is limited, that we need what he called the metacritic, to have something theoretical to uh, to oppose to dominant uh, form of uh, of power, but anyway, this is a, uh, probably the best, uh, the, the the most clear example of this what I called critique from uh, everyday mm, everyday uh, life. And also using uh, Boltański, I would like to use Boltański for my semi-empirical work. I am not. Uh, uh, but I would like. Uh, I am not uh, empirical uh, scientist. Right? rather conceptual, but I would like for this uh, project to use some some empirical materials. And there is a, what he called existential tests. So the tests uh, which are here, uh, I summarized uh, like the, uh, the most important condition of this existential test. But it is uh, existential uh, feelings of injustice or injustice that, uh, that is something uh, wrong with the uh, with the state, with the state politics, with the social life, political life, and so on and so on. I would say that the uh, uh, unexpected uh, mm, uh, situation in Poland, I mean, unexpected uh, success, uh, uh, election uh, success of uh, law and justice is a effect of this existential test of millions of people who uh, consider uh, power of uh, 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 civic uh, platform party as a kind of uh, promoting uh, unjust uh, relation uh, in uh, many spheres of uh, of uh, of uh, social life. So even people who are ideologically very far from uh, from law and justice, they form they they decided to vote for them because they thought that alternative. Existing alternative is so so unjust. So here I try to summarize again uh, Boltański uh, critique and conf uh, confirmation, and uh, you can see that on the side of critique is what I would say actors, body, uh, personal, uh, classic equivalent of critique, distance, irony. Uh, so is uh, is what I would say. Uh, elements which we we can find in everyday life. On the confirmation is always uh, kind of uh, something being impersonal, institutional, and so on. So something above uh, everyday um, everyday uh, life. So uh, finishing uh, my uh, short presentation. I would like um, uh, to summarize this, that I think that uh, politics of everyday life, everyday life 
is a point of departure for politics of critique, especially in democracy. So here I use a concept, again, from French uh, uh, historian, theoretician of democracy, Pierre Rossin Vallon, uh, who in his book uh, Counter Democracy Politics in the Age of Distrust uh, shows uh, overlooked dimension of democracy. Like, you know, it is not the voting, it is not the procedure and so on, but demonstration, looking at the, mm, at the fairness of procedure and so on and so on. And it was overlooked because people always look at the democracy as a kind of a harmonized um, uh, system. And everyday life is usually not harmonized. It is chaotic, it is fragmented, and so on. But it is important for uh, for um, for um, for democratic uh, for functioning of of uh, of uh, democracy. So this is the last uh, point. Uh, so I think that this uh, politics of everyday life is very important for the new social movements because these so new social movements. Uh, emerge from the mm, uh, from the experience of injustice in uh, everyday uh, everyday uh, life. So I would like to look at the you know uh, occupy movement to some uh, mass movement in uh, in different countries from uh, uh, from Turkey through Greek uh, Spain to Arab countries. And uh, what is the cru crucial for me, there is a commonly observing um, escape from party politics. People don't want to, to be classified or to, to do politics using uh, um, old uh, party, party lines. In fact, you know, the, now the, 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 the most important social uh, movements uh, consciously mm, avoid uh, uh, name uh, party. They 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 they, uh, they like to call themselves uh, different uh, different names like movement and so on and so on. And uh, what is interesting because this movement there is a long uh, tradition. Just finishing. There is a the long tradition in the democratic theory to the mm, kind of a fear or anxiety. Uh, against the masses, against the crowd. Of course, this is Le Bon and so on. Uh, but, uh, and uh, for this reason, I think that um, uh, it was never investigated. So my idea is to look at this uh, mass movement and try to find new way of democratic dialogue in, uh, in, uh, in them. Democratic dialogue which emerged from uh, everyday life politics. Thank you. Questions myself, but I certainly will not monopolize this. So, who would like to start? Yes, please. So, we will have to pass this around, I think. Thank you. To, uh, to the last. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I thank you very much for this very stimulating uh, talk. Um, but still, I think I didn't exactly get the point of uh, your distinction. You said you criticize the, the, uh, the view that uh, the politics is everywhere. But at, at the end, um, I have the impression that you come back to this view and uh, that it's very difficult to, to crystallize what belongs to politics. And uh, above all, because you, you have perhaps a more negative form of, of, uh, of yeah, construction of, of politics. But um, I would, perhaps I, I missed the point, but what is exactly the distinction or the distinctive aspect of the politics towards um, forms of life or religion, for example? Yeah. Uh, thank you for this question. You find my, I would say, soft spot. I am still working on this, <laughs> and it is not uh, clear, uh, clear, uh, clear for me. But I have clear intuition, at least, 
that we should differentiate. But probably uh, my intuition is that it, it would be very difficult to find, how to say, one sweeping formula for this. Probably we need to look at the uh, historical, uh, historical uh, uh, situation uh, when, uh, when some activities became uh, political. It could be, it could be sometimes uh, really strange. For instance, um, uh, I remember it was several times in the in the history history of movement, like the mm, demonstration of women coming with uh, mm, uh, uh, with um, just uh, saying uh, with the slogans that we need food to to feed our uh, kids and so on. And uh, and so then uh, it turned out that the, this uh, this situation, feeding uh, or food, became very much politicized, uh, but uh, not necessary. It can be uh, uh, everywhere and in uh, in uh, in every in every in every time. So uh, this my. Uh, 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 a kind of a warning against uh, this concept of sweeping politicization is that if we have politicized everything, like you know, uh, preparing food, then uh, oh, there is a good example. My, my wife is working on uh, on food as a cultural expert, and for instance, uh, she she found an interesting um, uh, interesting example that uh, 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 Italian futurist fascist Marinetti once. Uh, Publish a paper that uh, Italians should stop eating pasta because uh, it makes them lazy. They are not going to conquest the world, and so on and so on. It was a big discussion about eating pasta, so it was a clear. And Gramsci, even in uh, in his prison uh, intervention in the prison note, uh, notebooks. Uh, but uh, so this is suddenly uh, this kind of uh, activity. Uh, which uh, seems to be simple and apolitical, like eating pasta, became center of a uh, long uh, discussion about uh, imperialism and about food and so on and, and so on. So, uh, mm, of course, I, I know that it is not a <laughs> satisfying uh, answer, but I am going in this direction. So I have a comment to Lezek and a question to Susanna. Uh, Lezek, you showed us wonderful examples about how this everyday politics from the street kind of opposes a system, an authoritarian system. But I would strongly disagree to connect this to democracy. What we face in Germany nowadays is exactly what you describe, but it's a clearly non-democratic everyday politics that takes place every Monday evening at Dresden. In the street of Dresden. This is exactly this uh, opposition against a system. It's the feeling of being misrepresented. So this is, there is anti-politics from the street, but this is clearly not aimed at being democratically represented. This is something else. So and, there, and therefore I would, uh, I, would, I would warn against making this connection. Thank you, thank you, because that I have kind of a ideal, I, the idealizing concept of anti-politics from communism, mm. but you are right, mm. of course. Yeah. Okay. And my question goes, yeah, 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 question goes to Susanna. Susanna, my impression is that um, the whole career of intelligence relies on the intelligence test. So if you take the test out, probably the career of intelligence would collapse. And one could try to replace intelligence by klugheit or wisdom and then realize it's a completely different discourse. So my impression is it's a discourse centered on the test and not on the concept of it, or as a, on the test and not on intelligence. Uh, directly, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this comment and question. Well, yeah, I, I agree. The, the history of the intelligence corrosion and of um, intelligence testing is, is quite dominant in this discourse. And this is because people wanted to exp 
lane, a difference between the so-called modern concept of intelligence and ideas of intelligence, Klugheit, Weisheit, Schlauheit, whatever uh, who that existed uh, even before the 20th century. So this divide uh, at, at the early 20th century might be exaggerated uh, due to people who are heavily involved in the history of uh, mental measurement and mental testing. But I think that with my project that focuses on, on popular debates about uh, intelligence, um, this divide might be questioned. And this is why I um, start in the 19th century and not uh, in the early 20th century where the intelligence quotient becomes to be dominant because um, in popular discourse intelligence quotient and intelligence testing might not have been as um, important as historians of psychology and mental measurement who look at um, science and um, expert debates might have thought. Yeah, thank you very much for this comment. I think it illustrates uh, how, how dynamic this, this concept of intelligence is and how, how it changes during the times. But uh, yeah, I, I would like to, to learn more about this uh, discussion. So if you have some literature or some ideas, I, we might follow up on this. <laughs> um, my question goes uh, to Sonia. Um, I was very fascinated by your uh, uh, talk and uh, it reminds me uh, several um, issues that are ongoing in Italy, Poland and the US. So the first question is uh, what do you think is specific of the case of Russia because uh, there is a general backlash against reproductive rights. So this is the first question. The second one is you talk about um, a contradiction that um, somehow came from the legacy of the communist past between the working woman, if I got correctly, and the rule of mother. But um, I don't know if you have come across to the concept of re-traditionalization of gender rules uh, that I found in some uh, uh, literature related to Eastern Europe. I don't know if it can be applied also to Russia, and uh, I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. These are good questions. Um, to the question of what is specific to Russia, um, I would say yes, there are definitely parallels to sort of general backlash situations going on, um, especially between Poland and Russia. There's some parallels, although the Russian Orthodox Church, my like my activists whom I study, they wish they had the kind of influence that they think the, Pol the, the Roman Catholic Church has in Poland, and um, they do not, I think, both objectively and subjectively. Um, but um, I think what's specific, I mean, one of the things that is specific to Russia is um, the ubiquity of abortion as an experience among older generations of women. That is something you don't even really have to ask a woman if she's had abortions. You just kind of assume it and start the conversation based on that. Um, and the other is um, 
the way that abortion actually, I mean, there's, there is actually very little discourse of reproductive rights. Like there are very few people in Russia who would conceptualize abortion as a right because all these backs and forth between legalization and prohibition and restriction were never really the result of like a women's struggle or so. They, they always followed the rationale of the state of, you know, having, wanting to have more babies or wanting to have more women in production or so. So there was never kind of a, a movement for reproductive rights. Um, and even now, now in response to some legal restrictions, we've seen some kind of pro-choice mobilization, um, but again, it's it's very small, and um, um, so that is, I think, one of the things that is specific to Russia. Um, in terms of this concept of retraditionalization, I am familiar with with scholars who have used that. I would be a bit cautious with it because I think it assumes a kind of a simplistic view of what life was like under communism. Um, that uh, and. I mean, the studies of kind of everyday life and everyday gender role divisions um, in in Russia and in the Soviet Union very much show that that there in many regions there never was kind of a detraditionalization. So um, I mean, there was this idea that women would would get an education and work and often you know be in professions that in the West are still considered very masculinized, that are very kind of securely feminized in Russia such as, for instance, the judges that we heard of uh, in the morning. But on the other hand, the assumption that th the main fulfillment of a woman's role is still her role in the household and her role in childbearing and as a mother was never challenged through that. So I think it's more complicated than saying there was kind of a socialist progressive view of gender roles and now there's a uh, retraditionalization. I was surprised by the high rates of uh, abortion in, in Russia and the sudden decrease um, now. Mm -hmm. And I was asking, I was wondering if um, this has to do also with uh, a change in sexual education and access to anticonceptive uh, methods mm -hmm. other um, than abortion. Yeah, there's been a change pretty much since 2008. There's been a decline. So 2008 was the first year when there were slightly fewer abortions than live births, which is what these ratios show. Um, and since then, there's been actually quite uh, steep decline. Um, part of that comes from yes, higher rate of use of other contraceptive, you know, actual contraceptive methods. Um, part of it comes from the use of so-called mini abortions or medical abortions, kind of um, s uh, so pills that can be used within the first six months, uh, first six weeks of pregnancy. And which are, because they're not surgical procedures, they do not show up in these abortion statistics. So part of these are actually kind of somewhat misleading statistics. Um, um, and then another, there has also been some increase in the birth rate, which is, so the link that the government would like to make is we are, we are campaigning against abortion and the birth rate goes up. Um, that has partly, um, realized itself in response to s some pronatalist measures that um, the government has undertaken, Medvedev and Putin in their presidencies have undertaken, um, for instance, the most famous among them is the so-called maternity capital that a woman at the birth of a second child becomes, uh, receives access to the equivalent of about $10,000. So this is the largest baby bonus anywhere in the world that Russia offers that can be used for the education of the child or for improving housing conditions of the family or for the pension fund of the mother, so interesting alternatives. Um, so that has shown some effects that, that can be seen within the birth rate as well. Um, but if anybody, I don't want to monopolize at any cost really. But uh, just a uh, very brief remark to Susanna, <laughs> and also since I think, I mean, you all deal with the themes that you so elegantly discerned towards the end of your presentation, the constituting of the social and the way we conceptualize the social and social divisionings. Uh, and of course, that occurs throughout the history of the social sciences, and it certainly is a prevalent feature, as you pointed out, in the late 19th century, uh, 18th century, and not least in the Scottish environment. So you conceptualize what is the social, and what can what kind of properties do we assign to human agents who are social 
the discovery of the social as a category distinct from the state and so forth. And of course, at that stage, there is also all these problems of distinguishing the human from the non-human. What is human? Inventing the human science. At where do, where, what's the difference between human beings and, and other forms of life? And somehow I feel that many of those issues are being reopened in the current era, and that's why I feel that what you are talking about is so relevant. But if one limits one's attention to sort of your first two chapters, mm -hmm. uh, sort of late 19th, early 20th century, I think it's clear that, I mean, I, I, Sorsten, you're probably right uh, with sort of, it, the thing would look conceptually a bit different if you hadn't used m intelligence testing. But if you had thought of, the way you conceptualize sort of genetically defined properties or inherited properties versus something that you could sort of be socially constructing and affecting, the discussion would, I think, look very much like the way you present it. You have, mm -hmm. throughout the late 19th century in Britain, of course, a vivid discussion on eugenics, which presumes some kind of, some kind of properties, very much like the way intelligence is conceptualized, and if you read books such as Reba Soffer's Ethics and, and Society on the Revolution in the Social Sciences in Britain, 1870, 1914, an early classic, that is a central theme. Whereas other people have discussed things like that, such as when in the 1980s, people like Dietrich Rüschemeyer and Sida Scottpool revitalized our understanding of social knowledge and social structures. They would have put it in very different ways. And if you remember the book that they edited, in the nine in the well mid nineties with Princeton on social knowledge, state social knowledge and the origins of modern social policy. That would be a very different way of casting the story. So I think I think what you say is correct and I think you should defend your position <laughs> and, and I think you are basically right in discerning these poles and the way they go through history. And and to well, Sonia was wonderful to listen to really I re really enjoyed it. But um, to Leszek I would say that Aren't aren't you a bit a bit unfair to these people who use totalitarianism? I mean, some of them imagine that all of society is completely regulated, the kind of Orwellian world. But there are other people, uh, and I would think Claude Lefort would be one of them who does not imagine that. I mean, he he was engaged in the group Socialism or Barbarism, and very courageously actually took on Sartre in the late forties as a relatively young person. And I don't think he believed that there was nothing to be done and completely completely renounce the possibility of social action. And there is th another tradition which you didn't mention, that is what well you hear, have here, he had here in Israel, Jacob Talmon, who wrote that important book on the Orient of Totalitarian Democracy. And Shmuel Eisenstadt drew on that, but Shmuel and I think Talmon would never have denounced the possibility of human agents in society. Whereas you're perhaps a little bit too fair to, to Habermas, who I think precisely these features that you described to Arendt and Smith and others. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Of course, you are right. I mean, it was a short presentation. I even I, uh, in this uh, group, uh, Socialismo Barbary, uh, Castoriadis was even more uh, more uh, important from this point of view because he, he knew from uh, personal exper experience and so on and so on. Uh, so, and even, you know, I found uh, interesting uh, remarks in our own, uh, speaking about uh, the post-Stalinist Russia and showing possibility for agency. In fact, uh, it is uh, surprisingly, how to say, uh, surprising prophecy. He, he was able to, to look uh, and to to show that it is going to destroy. Uh, I mean, there's a democrati partially democratization after, uh, after the Stalinization. But so you are right. I will work on this. I'll take this as a comment. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is how, how it was meant. But I think you shouldn't have agreed so hastily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
add to it. I want to add to it. Add to it. I think it's just uh, it's a method to approach the problem and to comment on them. And that's all I'm saying. I don't deny it.